I am really excited to speak to you today from the book of Job. So we have been slowly working through our first few chapters of Job, which Chris has been taking us through. And today I'm going to wrap up the series by addressing the last 38 chapters. So wish me luck. <laughs> no, we're actually going to talk about Marduk and slot machines. Some of you are probably wondering, what on earth is this guy talking about? No, hang in there. So what we want to do today is talk about bad theology in the book of Job. And there are two different kinds of bad theology. There's one that's called Marduk theology, and the other one is called slot machine theology. And we're going to see the way in which God actually interacts with and corrects that theology. Now, I actually did something that I've never done before for a sermon. I actually went on to chat GPT, <laughs> and I typed out, I said, can you generate an image for me with Marduk and a slot machine? And it actually gave me an image. How many of you want to see it? Yes. All right. <laughs> slot machine and Marduk. I love it. I think it's awesome. I think I just uh, one up Chris. <laughs> All right, so we'll get back to this uh, Marduk and slot machine because you're still very curious. But if you remember, after Job loses all of his crops, all of his livestock, his children, and eventually his health, he sits in his ash heap in silence for seven days with his three friends. And by the time the seven days are over, we see in chapter three and four a transformation taking place, which Chris talked about last week. In the opening chapters of Job, we see a man of tranquility, a man who is deeply in trust of his savior, a sovereign God, regardless of his circumstances. But now we see Job begin to complain bitterly about his circumstances. And so Job, he breaks the silence after seven days. And we can only imagine, did he slowly stand up and like a volcano explode with a torrent of words? It says this, after this, Job opened his mouth and he cursed the day of his birth. In fact, there's a guy by the name of Stephen Mitchell. He translated the opening words of Job chapter 3 in this way. And I think it's actually brilliant. It really gets at the sense in which Job is complaining. God damn, I didn't swear. This is Job. God damn the day I was born and the night that forced me from the womb. Ooh. That's intense. It's clear that the three friends were not comfortable with this. Whoa. Wait a minute. Time out. How dare you talk to God that way? This has gone too far. And this is where we begin to see the theology of Job the book of Job and this bad theology start to come alive. Both Job and his friends had bad theology. And we're going to see God interact with that theology. But let's first just explore these different uh, versions of bad theology. First of all, we have Job's friends' bad theology which is what we call, which I call slot machine theology. This is the theology where the Job, where the friend, all they saw was an exact reason for Job's suffering. There was a clear and obvious explanation. They saw Job sitting in the ashes and they assumed that the reason he was sitting there, it was obvious, he was guilty of sin. I call this slot machine theology. It's the view of the world where you put in a coin and you get out a particular result. 
You take a good coin, you put it into this slot machine, and you get out praise and rewards. You take an evil coin, you put it in the slot machine, and you get punishment. You get consequences. Slot machine theology was the conventional wisdom of the sages, governed by the systematic formulation that if someone suffers, they are wicked. And if someone prospers, they are righteous. Now, Job thought this was ridiculous. And Job passionately opposed this ideology, for he knew that he was innocent, and he was. And we see this play out in the majority of the book. And as a result, he came to see that the way God ruled his creation was through the lens of Near Eastern warrior imagery. To him, God was like Marduk, an unpredictable, cruel, and empathetic warrior in his dominion. He is uncaring, and his justice was arbitrary. We see this uh, play out in uh, Job 30. Job's wrong theology playing out in this way. He says this, I cry to you, and you don't answer. I stand up, but you just look at me. You are cruel to me. Attack me with the strength of your hand. And he goes on. You lift me up to the wind and make me ride. You melt me in this war. I know you will return me to death, the house appointed for all of the living. Therefore, to Job, life was utterly meaningless and void of purpose. And so Job, he did not curse God. Even though he didn't curse God, he felt like he no longer had any place in God's creation or purposes. And so what was the solution? Now we look at, so we looked at two versions of bad theology. Now we're going to look at two versions of a solution. How do they deal with this bad theology? First of all, Job's friend's wrong solution. And this is call for repentance. The three friends, they argued relentlessly that the solution to Job's suffering was found in his repentance. Each of the three friends do this in their own way. And they do this over and over again. But here's what Bildad says in chapter Eight. And I use the, I'm going to use the message translation because I think the message really helps us get a sense of the language. So build out. He says to Job, does God mess up? Does God Almighty ever get things backward? It is plain, it is obvious that your children sinned against him. Otherwise, why would God have punished them? Here's what you must do. And don't put it off any longer. Get down on your knees before the God Almighty. If you are as innocent and upright as you say, it is not too late. He'll come running. He'll set everything right again. Reestablish your fortune. Even though you're not much right now, you'll end up better than ever. A call to repentance. You like to think that these three friends sat patiently in the ash with Job because they truly cared for him. But really, they already had their minds made up. They were like the three priests waiting in the confession booth for Job to fess up and repent. And this is why I think the ash heap was really the confession booth. The ash heap was really the confession booth. And I think that this is more familiar than we realize. This is the same thing as when someone who is going through a real period of difficulty and suffering, and they hear from other people, maybe their friends and family, say to them something like this. Maybe God is trying to teach you something. They're with you in the hash sheep. They're sitting with you and comforting you, but maybe God is trying to teach you something. Have you been fasting? Have you been praying? 
Are you keeping up with your journal? Where's your faith at? Do you have enough faith? The common denominator here is that it is really just your fault. It's your fault that you're in the ash heap. It's your fault that you're suffering. So you need to fess up. Make the apology and make it right. It's your fault. So that is Job's friend's wrong solution. We're going to see Job's right solution. We'll find out later why he's right. But his solution is to contend with God. Contrary to his friends, he believed that he was innocent and suffering disproportionately and unjustly. Therefore, his best approach was to confront God and demand a meeting. Job is desperate, and he longed for someone to stand in the middle between him and God so that the case could be heard, so that both sides could be represented. But there was no one. In another place, we can see this desperation really come to life. He says this in Job 31, verse 35. If only someone would listen to me. Look, I will sign my name to my defense. Let the Almighty answer me. Let my accuser write out the charges against me. If only someone would listen to me. Out of desperation and yet a spirit of courage, Job challenges God to come out of hiding. And if God doesn't respond, then Job will be forced to conclude that the answer that he seeks, like the God he has relentlessly pursued, are nowhere to be found. If there's not an answer, then there's no God. And if there's a God, he's out to get me. And here's the question for you. Are you not bothered? Are you not bothered by Job's outrageous curse in chapter 3 and the abrasive way he challenges God's justice? Does it bother you? Does it make you feel uncomfortable? The truth is, for many people, it really bothers them and it makes them feel uncomfortable. And then, when we get to Yahweh's, uh, the speeches from God, from the whirlwind, at the end of the book, they are convinced that God has definitively put Job in his place and shut him down for his arrogance and challenging divine justice. After all, Job responds to God after the last speech, and he says this, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. It settled them, right? Job needed to be beat down and forced into submission because he spoke inappropriately. However, the challenge of this reading is that God rebukes Job's friends and not Job. Job, or God, rebukes his three friends not once but twice in the last chapter. He says this, you have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. So we got a tension here. Surely, if the goal wants to force Job into submission for his reckless behavior and outrageous talk back, then God would have actually praised Job's friends for trying to keep Job in check. For Job did not speak the truth about him. That's not what happened. So what is going on here? So here's why I want to show you a couple of things, actually a few things, that happen when God finally speaks from the whirlwind. And we begin to see these two speeches and the ways in which God corrects Job's theology. And so let's start with the first speech, and I'm actually only going to give you a brief sampling. A verse here and a verse there. But here he starts with this speech number one, which is a tour through creation. It is actually a roller coaster through creation. But here he starts out in verse one. He says this, 
Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. He said, Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Boise yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. And after he says this, by the use of poetry, God takes him on a roller coaster ride through his creation. And so he first takes him to the beginning of creation. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. He says this next. Who shut up the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the wound, when I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness? Huh. We'll come back to this. But after he takes him to the beginning of creation, he takes him to the wonders of the atmosphere. And he says this. Again, just one verse of men. Does the rain have a father? Who fathers the drops of dew? From whose womb comes the ice? Who gives birth to the frost from the heavens? I love that. <laughs> and then he takes him to the zoo. First to the end of creation, to the beginning of creation. Then he takes him to the heights of the atmosphere, and now he takes him to the zoo. And he says this, Do you hunt the prey for the lioness and satisfy the hunger of the lions? When they crouch in their dens or lie wait in the thicket, who provides food for the raven when its young cry out to God and wander about for a lack of food? We're going to see that in each of these realms in creation, Job's Marduk theology is challenged. If you remember, Job complained that God is a divine warrior, ruling with brutal domination, but then he saw God as the divine midwife. A divine midwife. God, not a divine warrior, he's a divine midwife. It's hard to imagine wrapping the cosmos in a diaper. But the point is that God establishes and he sustains his creation. He is not like the conquering spirit of Marduk, but the parental provider displaying his bursting pride and captivation over his handiwork. And particularly interesting is what God says about the animals in the zoo. From the lion, the raven, to the hawk, and the vulture, God displays himself in direct opposition to the character of Marduk and many other gods like him in the ancient Near Eastern. These animals, these animals in the zoo, are not creatures to be defeated or controlled or domesticated, but God is attentive to their every need. For example, God does not ask Job to kill the lion. He does not ask Job to conquer and subdue the lion. He asks Job to provide for the lion. Go get food for the lion. Don't kill him. God is the loving parent. He's the loving gardener, the farmer, the zookeeper, the divine midwife of his creation. He is not the uncaring warrior. And this is the purpose. This is the goal of the first speech. The first speech has a goal to correct Job's Marduk theology. And then he takes him into the second. Actually, let me back up. Then Job responds. After leaving the zoo, he responds and he says this, I am unworthy. How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. I spoke once, but I have no answer. Twice, but I will say no more. And so, Job, he puts his hands over his mouth, and he is stunned, and he's silent. I actually think there's a spirit of, of shame going on here. He's responding out of shame. But the silence of Job does not satisfy God. 
And this is partly why God sent him back into his tour. And this time, he takes him into the realm of myth and monster to see the behemoth and the Leviathan. Now, what is... Actually, right here, he, before he shows him the behemoth and Leviathan, he says this. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Just like the first time. And now he's going to introduce him to behemoth and Leviathan. Now, what are these creatures? What are these monsters? These guys are Asian monsters from the world of ancient Near Eastern literature. The Leviathan is most commonly understood as the sea monster, and he's referenced as the sea monster in, in the other places in Job. And the behemoth is the land monster. Both are magnificent and terrifying in size and scope. And what is profound about these speeches, in, about this speech is that when God introduces Job to these creatures, he invites Job to consider behemoth. And he says this. Look at behemoth, which I made along with you. Look at behemoth, which I made along with you. God is setting it up that he wants Job to see himself in the behemoth and to see himself in the Leviathan. And we're going to see this play out. But this verse, I love this verse because what God, what God is doing is he's telling Job, Behemoth is your sibling. Behemoth is your brother. I meet him along with you. And the connection between Job and the Behemoth is fascinating. I can show you many examples in this passage, but here is just one. If you remember, actually, we didn't read this verse earlier, but earlier in Job, Job complains, and he says this, Do I have the strength of a stone? Is my body made of bronze? No, I am utterly helpless without any chance of success. And what he is most likely referring to is the, the torrent of arguments that he's receiving from his friends. I am utterly helpless in the face of their relentless pursuit of slot machine theology. And then here's what Job says later in, in chapter 40. He says this of Behemoth. Its bones are tubes of bronze. Its limbs are bars of iron. And he says this. Even if the river is turbulent, it is not frightened. It is confident, though Jordan rushes against his mouth. We're going to see there's something very similar with the Leviathan, but what's happening here is God is affirming Job and the way that he has stood up to his friends. God wants Job to see himself in the strength and the bravery of the behemoth. But what about the Leviathan? Job wants, God wants Job to see himself in the fearlessness of Leviathan. As majestic as behemoth is, with all its power and strength, it is nothing compared to the Leviathan. God wants to see himself, God wants to see Job see himself in the Leviathan. So if you remember Job's Marduk theology and the understanding of these monsters, they appear to be parallel to the Asian Near Eastern cultural understanding. For example, Job says to God, he says this, I will not keep silent. I will speak out in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. Am I the sea, O oh, the monster of the deep, that you put a muzzle over me? Am I the sea that you put the muzzle over me? Job is essentially saying, I will not stop 
pursuing you. I will not stop talking. I will not stop expressing my anger and my grief. I will not give up. Are you going to conquer me like you conquer the Leviathan? Are you going to put a muzzle over my mouth? I dare you. His friend would have loved for God to do that. But here in chapter 41, verse 1 to 4, the Leviathan is portrayed as having a wild tongue. A wild tongue that is untamable. Leviathan does not speak, you know, speak out pleading for mercy or speak soft words of submission to his attackers. He says this, can you pull in Leviathan with a fish hook or tie down his tongue with a rope? Can you put a cord through his nose or pierce his jaw with a hook? Job is talking about the speech of Job. That's what God is talking about. And then he goes on, he says this. Will I keep begging you for mercy? Will I speak to you with gentle word? Will I make an agreement with you for you to take it as your slave for life? It's all about Job's speech. And then he says this. His snorting throws out flashes of light. His eyes are like the waves of dawn. Flames stream from his mouth. Sparks of fire shoot out. Smoke pours from his nostril as from a boiling pot over burning weeds. His breath sets cold to blaze and flame dark from his mouth. Nothing on earth is his equal. A creature without fear, it looks down on all that are haughty, is king over all that are proud. God is incredibly proud of Leviathan. And in doing so, he is actually also incredibly proud of Job. Because Job is like Leviathan. And so what is God doing here? Comparing Job to the behemoth and the Leviathan. I believe that the purpose of the first speech is to correct Job, Job Marduk theology. God is the loving parent over creation. And in the second speech, God is affirming Job's approach. He is affirming Job's solution. That is a stubborn pursuit of God. God wants Job to see himself in the braveness, the stubbornness of Behemoth, and in the fearlessness of the Leviathan. In other words, the theology might be off, but his posture was bang on. And so how does Job then respond to the second speech? A lot of debate has been taking place given to the translation and the interpretation of Job's response in chapter 42, verse 5 to 6. But Job first acknowledges his ignorance. He says, surely I spoke a thing I did not understand, thing too wonderful for me to know. And then he says this. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. These last two verses, especially this last verse, are highly debated among Old Testament scholars. Hebrew poetry is very difficult to translate and is very difficult to understand, but I tend to agree with the group of scholars who would argue that it makes more sense to translate this verse given the context and theology as this. And we see this in the Common English Bible. My ears had heard about you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I relent and I find comfort about dust and ashes. Job had now seen and heard God clearly, and he relents or he retracts his mistaken assumptions about how God ran the universe. Job now finally realizes that God does not micromanage or domineer over his creation. But what is he comforted about? What Job, what Job wants 
Considered cruel abuse because of his wrong Mardukan theology, he now sees it as comfort. Despite being dust and ashes, he has been heard and he has been taken seriously. He is not alone and he matters to God. The God of the universe knows him by name. There's something, there's something here about Job finally coming to a place of letting go of his misguided ideas of who God is. Sometimes when we go through really difficult times, something really hard, the natural tendency is to turn inward. And when we turn inward, we become the center of the universe. That is what Mardukian theology does. It makes us clench our fists. Now I'm the center of the universe. But at some point, we need to say to ourselves that I'm going to have to let go. When we let go of that mentality, when we open our hands, suddenly we take the pressure off of ourselves and we can open our fists and breathe a huge sigh of relief. <sighs> I'm going to be okay. God is with me, and I am not alone. For me, this has been something that I have wrestled with many times over my life because I was born severely to profoundly deaf, because of my hearing disability. I was bullied, I was made fun of, but I also had friends who came alongside me and wanted to pray healing over me. I had one friend take me to Winnipeg. I don't remember how old I was. I think I was in middle school. Not, but not in high school, but it was in middle school. He took me to a big healing service in Winnipeg. There was a well-known preacher, a healing guy that came to Winnipeg, and we went. And I remember walking down the aisle to have my hand, to have his hand laid on me and to pray for me. It was actually a row of people, and I was just one of the many people in that row. And I can't, and I remember the feeling of disappointment as nothing happened. No magic took place. And I remember the desperation inside of me resulted in a clenching of the fists. Not fair. Why does this have to happen to me? And after some time, I was eventually able to let go and to open my hand and be okay with the fact that I have a hearing disability. The God of the universe, he knows me by name. And from time to time, since then, there are moments in my life where I've retreated back into that clenching of the fist, angry that this isn't fair. Part of my disability is that I have an accent. I have a speech impediment. I sound different. And sometimes I'm hard to understand. Not fair. This is frustrating. I remember years ago, me and my dad went uh, snowboarding in Banff. And somewhere in the resort, I don't remember exactly where it was, someone asked me, hey, are you from Ireland? And at the time I thought, no, I'm just a Mennonite boy from Manitoba. I'm not from Ireland. Sometime later, Actually, years later, I was thinking back to that time, and it dawned on me, he was just hearing my deaf accent. And that was a moment when I realized I'm just an Irish Mennonite. <laughs> and those clenched fists began to open. And I said to myself, it's okay, 
I can laugh about it. I'm an Irish Mennonite. Now, I really didn't want to say that. And here's the reason why. I didn't want to say that because it sounds like I'm telling you to just have a nonchalant attitude about whatever you're going through. To have an attitude of, who cares? That is not what I'm trying to communicate. I'm not trying to make light of whatever hardship or suffering you have gone through or are going through. What I am trying to say is that no matter what you have gone through, no matter the valley, no matter how dark your day feels at the moment, God is with you. And he knows you by your name. I love the last words in Job. Where God rebukes Job's friend and he says this, I am angry with you and your two friends because you have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. It is here that finally God rebukes the slot machine theology. And it's the fact, the fact is, what really matters is that God, that Job spoke, spoke to God. And Job's friend only spoke about God. What matters is you speak to God. That's what matters. That's what God wants. He does not want you to be silent. He wants you to speak. Speak like the Leviathan. Be brave like the behemoth. And just to wrap it up, I thought there were two invitations buried in these last chapters of Job. Two invitations. Number one, can we let go of our bad pictures and ideas of who God is? And when we let go, can we pick up the image of God as a loving parent, a loving gardener, a farmer, and a midwife? Can we pick those images up and let go of the divine warrior? And number two, we are being invited to contend with God and honestly do it without fear. If Job is affirmed in his brutal honesty about his suffering, then I'm here to tell you that the door is flung wide open to the permission to express our own honesty about our own suffering, our own question and doubts. God is not so fickle, he's not so sensitive that he can't handle your honesty. He can handle it. He wants you to be honest. So why don't we take just a minute to just be silent and just meditate on these two invitations. God, thank you that you're not like Marduk. And thank you for the way that you revealed yourself to Job as a midwife, a gardener, a farmer, and a loving parent. And it's so contrary to the image of a warrior hell-bent on destroying us with whatever random reason that is unaware to us. And thank you for the call to live under that truth. And God, I pray that we will be able to let go of the bad ideas, bad images of who you are, and to pick up the true images. And God, help us to find ourselves and see ourselves in the behemoths 
and the Leviathans to be honest. To be honest about our struggle, to be honest about our questions and our doubts because you want them and we are completely safe in your arms. Thank you that you know each of us by name and you love us and you care for us. Amen.